is the Page Publishing Book Club. How you doing? I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. We are going to start off with an author who's no longer with us, but he left behind his inspiring story and he's lucky to have a friend willing to share his book with the world. Coach, Are You Crazy? was written by William Andy Hawks. He lived with an enlarged heart for 30 years and died a few months ago at 65. So his longtime friend and fellow coach, Jay Perdue, has stepped up to tell us about a man who led an extraordinary life and helped a lot of young people along the way. Andy was a really good friend of mine. He and I coached together for 30 years in North Carolina. We coached football together and we coached wrestling together. Uh, Cummings High School in Burlington, North Carolina. Were you like crazy competitive? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we um, actually coached against each other and coached together. And we also coached football together. From what I'm reading, it's a story of perseverance. Yeah, it's perseverance, brotherhood with all the guys he worked with and the kids, you know, and then him persevering through his life. I mean, he he came through some tough times. Um, When he was a baby, his um, mom and dad basically gave him up. And he was raised by his grandparents. Um, then he, he grew up and he was a really good high school um, football and wrestling star at Graham High School. And then um, he went on to uh, Elon University, uh, where he was a wrestler at Elon University. And he did really well there. And then after that, he got into coaching um, and he coached. He had various coaching stops around the state of North Carolina before he ended up back at uh, Graham High School. And that was where I was at Western Alamance. We coached against each other. And then he came over for a short time to Western where I was. And we coached together. And then we left and went to Cummings High School. And that's where we spent most of our career. And that's where um, we had a lot of success. Won several state championships in football. Um, Andy ended up uh, winning a lot of wrestling matches. And ended up in the uh, North Carolina State Hall of Fame. The, uh, he, he's a member of the Cummings Hall of Fame. Then he got inducted into the State Hall of Fame in North Carolina as a wrestling coach. You know, nothing was easy. You're fighting through, um, you know, low pay, long hours. You have the heartbreaks of, you know, you've worked real hard, you, you lose games, and then you have the, the highs of winning state championships. So I think he wanted to tie all that together. And at the same time, you know, his life wasn't easy either. You know, he fought heart problems and still continued to coach. He was in a a catastrophic bus accident, actually taking wrestlers to a tournament uh, where he was driving the activity bus and and broke both of his legs and he had to be hospitalized for a while. And so, yeah, you know, he was one of these guys. He grew up he grew up on a farm, so he kind of had a lot of those country farmer sayings. If he had a kid who was. um you know, worried about what they're doing two weeks from now. And his famous saying was, he would say, don't worry about the mule going blind, just load the wagon. You know, he would say (laughs) stuff like that. He'd say stuff like that to the kids. And one of his favorite sayings is, you got to remember this in life. He said, some uh, get the peanut, some get the shell, and some get the bag with a hole in it. You know, he would, (laughs) but but that, that's how he would communicate uh, with those, with that country humor. And the kids adored him. They loved him. Because, you know, we, we dealt with a lot of kids who may have had one, one or more parents um, incarcerated. Um, and um, so a lot of times, you know, Coach Hawks or any of the coaches were kind of look, looked at as like a surrogate father. And several um, NFL players, um, Brandon Tate, that just finished his career with the Cincinnati Bengals. The Patriots drafted him out of University of North Carolina. He played for us. Will Richardson is playing for the Jacksonville Jaguars right now. He's offensive tackle. He played at, at North Carolina State. Um, so we've had various kids that's gone on to, um, you know, play major college football. A bunch of them played at University of North Carolina. Um, wow. And so, you know, a lot of a lot of real, real big success stories that came out of those kids. 
Thank you for uh, doing this interview. Absolutely. The Healing Power of Writing, a familiar theme on this show, and Christine Bialzak is one more example. She's on hiatus from teaching after suffering unthinkable tragedy. She lost her husband and her son in less than two years. But through blogging and writing poetry, she's found comfort and support And now she's published the second children's book of her four-part series. It's entitled Penelope Picks Her Pals. My inspiration was my great niece, me and as an adult with grown children, the first baby born into the family. I loved the name. And the night she was born, I just wrote the first book and then just kind of went from there. And so tell me what Penelope Picks Her Pals is about. Little alliteration there. I've always loved alliteration. Younger kids love it. Years ago, I wrote for a first grade class, I wrote a complete story on their class just using their names and alliteration. Kids love seeing their names in print. So as I went through each letter of the alphabet, of course, I thought of, you know, my friends and their children's names. So most of the names in the book are of good friends of their children or grandchildren, you know, people that I know, because I figure, you know what, what's better than, you know, sharing my writing and then saying, oh, but make sure you look for your name in this. It's just about, it's just about Penelope going to school and pretty much going around and introducing all of her friends. And it starts with Ava and I think it ends with Zachary. It just talks a little bit about each kid, one or two sentences just saying something nice about the child and how they learn or how they act at school from a child's perspective, even though the vocabulary is a little bit higher, it's definitely a book to read to children. In in one of my public readings at a library, I found that it's a tongue twister, which the kids, the kids actually, they really like, and they, they thought it was really funny. Of course they did. <laughs> so... Even in, you know, in that in that one reading, I was able to talk to the children, you know, sitting in front of me and say, well, what's your name? And, you know, what words can we find to describe your name? And so it was really fun. It was just a way of of connecting and, you know, just having kids think about themselves, you know, with positive adjectives, I guess you'd say. So do you do a lot of readings? I've done a few. I have a few libraries that, you know, have said contact me in the spring when things slow down. Well, also there's summer programs and reading programs. And right. You could be reading every day, I'm sure. Oh, definitely. Definitely. And actually over, over Christmas vacation, I sat to and from Florida. I sat with the principal of a Sandy Hook Elementary. You know, he, so he's invited me to go read to his, to his school. That's yeah, nice. so it's 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 nice. It's it's a great way to make connections. All of my Penelope um, pictures, I guess, of her are on different kinds of merchandise. So there is merchandise with her on it. That's great. That's great. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, so I carry all my stuff around in my Penelope bag, and I have my Penelope stickers and bookmarks and that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's fun. It's I I absolutely love it. I love kids. I love and I love writing. So it's perfect combination. Elliot Mason is a freelance writer in Southern California, so you'd think writing his first novel, The Arlington Orders, would be a natural, right? Not so fast. Initially, I was really intimidated by it, to be honest with you. Uh, the, I had a lot of ideas, but the idea of actually writing a full-fledged novel was uh, something I wasn't anticipating. But um, I learned a kind of a trick very early on was not to write in a linear fashion, never go chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. That That is the kiss of death for a writer, I think, because it allows uh, or it creates a problem in terms of getting writer's block. And what I learned to do was I learned to write a single scene out. And when I write that single scene out, basically, I don't know if that's going to be chapter one or chapter 41, but I'll keep on doing that. And maybe sometimes I'll just write a paragraph. And eventually what I'll do is I'll write enough chapters and then be able to kind of jigsaw it together into a a constructive story. And uh, that's kind of how I learned how to do it. You know, it's much different writing a, you know, a 400 page book as opposed to a 500 word article. (laughs) So there's a huge difference between that and carrying a storyline and developing characters of that nature. So um, it comes much easier now because the intimidation factor is no longer there. I kind of have a method about it. So. And you picked, I mean, this is a, this is an historical novel, right? Yes, it's historical fiction. And it's actually, um, 
I've always been fascinated with history. I was a history major in college, and I've been a big fan of people like Dan Brown. So the idea of writing historical fiction really appealed to me. Uh, this book is actually based on a real-life incident that happened during the Civil War. Uh, it was called The Dahlgren Affair. It was actually very well publicized. It was basically an assassination attempt on Confederate President Jefferson Davis in 1864. And the person who attempted it, he was killed outside the capital of Richmond, Virginia, which was the capital of the Confederacy. And uh, when the Confederates searched his body, they found a set of orders on him. And the order said, you are to kill President Davis, you are to kill everybody in the Confederate government, and you are to burn Richmond to the ground. And it was very controversial because at that time there was kind of a gentleman's agreement between North and South that uh, civilian heads of state would not be targeted. So the South wouldn't target Lincoln, the North wouldn't target anybody in the Confederate government. And it was really well publicized throughout the, uh, the South. Because of that incident, and because the war was not going well for the South, they decided to evacuate the capital. And when they evacuated the capital, they uh, getting the people out wasn't the problem. The problem was they had all their gold and silver reserves there. So what they tried to do was to create a secret plan to move it out of the capital to an undisclosed location. And in that secret operation, it disappeared without a trace. And to this day, no one knows what happened to it. If, if it were discovered, it'd be the most significant discovery in American history. Uh, it's uh, got a lot of historical provenance to it. So... Um, Basically, I took that story and I created a fictional story where people discover clues, but it's more of a dark political thriller. I've always been fascinated with the Civil War because uh, we're still struggling with it to this day. I mean, think about all the news that we have with Confederate monuments being torn down, the controversy. and mm -hmm. it's, it's something that we've never come to terms with as a nation, and I've always been fascinated with. So I thought it, to bring it up to a modern day time where it's a suspense thriller where it has political impl implications today. To sell this book, um, do you have to find a specific audience? Well, yeah, we've done uh, actually some very different things. I launched a social media campaign that hit over a half million people, and uh, we've been targeting various cities. Now we're going to be moving in the south towards Atlanta. Uh, I had an idea that, of creating a movie trailer except for a book. I, I hired professional actors, and we, I wrote out these one-minute monologues which describe each character. So these actors acted out these characters, and it really turned out very well. Um, my old school, where I graduated from, USC has a book fair. It's one of the largest book fairs in the, in the country. It's uh, sponsored by the Los Angeles Times, and uh, I'll be doing book signing out there. There's going to be 150,000 people over a two-day period at, on the USC campus who go to this book fair every year. So the steam engine is picking up speed here. Very good, Elliot. Some great promotional ideas there. Thanks. It's all about family for Maggie Fetzer, who started writing her book, Visions, the first of a trilogy 12 years ago. That's how long it took her to find Paige. And now you can share your story. Um, a lot of the book carries a lot of my family. For instance, the main character, Julia, that's the name of my grandmother. And... The color purple is her favorite color, along with Julia. And uh, little things like that really helped because they say the best thing to do is write about something you know. And I think I really know my family. I wanted to write about it. It's a different experience. You see so many different traits in this young character, because she's only eight years old, that carried through my childhood, my sister's childhood, my mother's, my grandmother's. It was just all a combination of how my family was generated. The story is actually about Julia. I call it Julia's Trilogy. Uh, the first book is Visions. The second is Sightings. The third is Reflections. Um, she travels. She's a spirit. And she travels from Virginia to Arizona to Louisiana. And her journey involves helping people along the way. I actually think anybody that reads this book will be inspired. Visions takes place in Bentley, Virginia, in the Shenandoah Valley. Each journey that the different characters have relate to something different from their particular life. Ellie is a young woman that Julia guides to a better life. She moves from Manhattan, New York, to Ben Vi, Virginia, and she creates a bed and breakfast because she loves people and she wants to entertain. She's a single woman. 
she meets the love of her life and begins a new life with him. Ellie was in a marriage where she was degraded, more or less mentally abused. And she did not want to live her life that way. And she was fearful of making a big change. But the fact that she lost all of her very close-knit family within a very short period of time left her standing alone to face the world. So Julia was quite the inspiration to keep her more or less involved in the future and opened her eyes to see that there is a different life out there for you. I guess I guess you could say Vision is um, a happy, feel-good book, which I think in this world we need more of. Yeah, I do too. Thanks for that. Yeah. I did have a couple of book signings at Barnes & Noble here in Mansfield, Ohio, that is close, and I am scheduling one for Sandusky, Ohio, that was pretty close to my location. And um, the book signings, I think they go well as long as the store advertises. And I guess I need that website in order to get myself to advertise. Or Twitter. That's yeah, right. And them. word of mouth is real good advertisement. But you know, those words just get so far. <laughs> now, um, the second book sightings is actually in cover design right now. Oh, okay. So we'll be talking again real soon, right? I hope so. All right, Maggie. And we're going to take a very short break. We're coming right back. So should you. This is the Page Publishing Book Club. Attention all authors. Page Publishing is looking for authors. Have you written a book and want to get it published? Page Publishing will get your book into bookstores and for sale online at Amazon, Apple iTunes, and other outlets. They handle all aspects of the publishing process for you. Printing, cover art, publicity, copyright, and editing. Call 800-204-6099 now for your free author submission kit. That's 800-204-6099 for your free author submission kit. We're back on the Page Publishing Book Club. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. Betsy Beck ministers to women fighting addiction, abuse, and hopelessness. She writes every chance she gets, particularly when she says God speaks through her. And now she's published God's Ultimate Love. I really just had thought it was calling for myself just to go back and read when I was like in a down place. And I'd go back and read it and it would just lift my spirits up. But then I went to revival, and this lady called me out, and she said, and I had never seen her before, and she said, Betsy, it's time to get that book published. So I knew that it was in God's timing. It's really about Jesus on the cross, his blood he shed, and the benefits that we have from that life that he gave to us, and how we can claim those benefits and let it become a way of life to us. You're going to find that God has given us to me a great gift, which is Jesus Christ. That's what I write about, about Jesus and what he did at Calvary's cross and who it makes you because, hey, he gave his blood and his life for us that we could become part of that kingdom in heaven and be what he wants us to be, and that is to take the gospel to the lost and the dying world, you know. But it's revelation that I get through those scriptures that he really just gives me revelation of who we can become, and you take those scriptures and add them to your daily life and let it become a way of life to you, and that is his commandments of how to live your life. Can you give me an example of one of your revelations that I'll find in your book? Yes, ma'am. One of them is that a word cannot be a word until it is spoken out of your mouth because it lies dormant. And even Jesus could not become alive in this world if we did not speak his name. So it's like he's saying to us, if you take my word, pick it up, and speak it out of your mouth and let it become a word, it will put action to it, and you can live what I, and have what I tell you you can. But it has to be spoken out of your mouth or it just lies dormant, any word. And so you take the word of God, 
and begin to speak it out of your mouth like if you have if you need a healing go in the word that says with jesus stripes we were healed and apply that to your life every day and if it's uh a problem you have in your life. Well, God said, I, Jesus said, I come to bring you life abundance. And if I take that word and put it out in front of me, like if I take it and, and begin to prophesy it over my life, well, then it's going to become alive and active within me. And I'm going to be able to do and have what God says I have and what I can do. Okay. And I take scriptures. Dr. Anthony Todd Brown is a chaplain for the Houston Police Department, a crisis chaplain, and he teaches at the county jail, which inspired his book entitled Jail Ministry, The Role of Hope. The number one goal is to stop recidivism, men going and coming to jail. If they can stay out of jail for three years, the recidivism rate goes way down. But the, per- the point of it is hope. Hope is anticipation to what is available to you. Most guys get out have absolutely no hope, meaning that if you have resources provided to you when you get out of jail, you're going to end up doing the same thing again. So the, what is the role of hope being that is something better? That's something better. You don't have to be a drug dealer. You don't have to be a bank robber. No, you don't have to do these things to survive. Hope says, I would rather have a job working for $200 a jack-in-the-box than $2,000 selling drugs. Hope says that, that, that is a better to come. That means when you are in jail, you need to get an education or to learn a skill. Before you do that, which is absolutely true, before you do that, you need to know that as a God. Right. Many guys have no understanding. of. They've heard of God. They think he's out there somewhere, but they don't know that God is a personal God. I have seen the word of God change the most heart in me. I'm talking about guys tattooed from the eyeball to the toenail. Guys walk out. When they hear the word of God, the truth of God's word, Boo hoo crying. I had a guy that come to my church yesterday. He had been in jail. For, he was sent to jail for murder, uh, aggravated assault, and drug dealing. He did six years in jail. I said, don't you know that's by the grace of God you out? Because most guys who kill somebody, they're in jail for life. His life has been completely changed. I was just telling somebody, nobody is too far gone for God. If you look at the Bible text, you see many people that God used had a horrible background. David, not only t- he took another man's wife and had the man killed. The Apostle Paul was a persecutor of Christian. Peter lied three times. Moses killed somebody. So just because you have a horrible, I say God's glory shines brighter with a black backdrop. The, the book is about what does God have to say about your life, and it's also about how do we, the justice system. It, are, it, are they in jail to incarcerate or rehabilitate? That's the question. What is the purpose of jail? Incarceration or rehabilitation? I think they're feeling on both counts. If you only want to put a man in jail, just to put him in there, throw away the key, when he gets out of jail, he's going to be a better criminal. If you put him there to rehabilitate him, give him a, like you just said, give him a skill, now you have rehabilitated him, give him a, another option. That's hope. Uh, I, I talk about restorative justice, that other type of justice. I talk about right now our prison system is failing, and it's millions of millions of dollars being spent to house a man in jail. It's over $150 a day to house one man in jail. And now jail is a is a industry. People are building jails as for profit. So 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 we have a whole misconception of what the purpose of jail is for before. We just recycling prisoners. We're making them better we're making them better criminals when they get out of jail. God put a passion on my heart for men in jail. In the Harris County jail there's seventeen hundred and forty inmates. Sixty percent black, twenty percent Hispanic, and twenty percent other. I wanna have it when you see a young black man walking down the street, you I can hear your voice because you won't be scared to walk by. You will not want to walk across the street because you see his pants drooping. I'm trying to change that. County they still have a chance. Some of the guys don't stay in. They, they don't go direct to detective department to get a second chance. I'm trying to work with those guys who are in the county so when they get out of jail, they don't make the same mistakes again. Finally, a message from James Blessing who says God told him to write his book entitled From Here to the Everlasting. Greetings, my true friends. My name is James Blessing. Please don't touch that dial. This may be the most wonderful message of hope you have ever heard. Many people believe because the lawyers lie, the politicians lie, the religions are false, the Pope fabricates, that there is no God nor true message from God. Here is the truth. There is a good and logical God, and this God does have a true message of hope and love 
and miracles for you and your loved ones. This new book, From Here to Everlasting, gives you all of this while exposing the religions, the Pope, the lawyers, and the politicians as the liars that they are. In fact, they are the opposite direction from God. Many people in religion will never be with God, but you can be with God. From Here to Everlasting, this new book by James Blessing explains that there is no forever hellfire torture as the religions falsely preach. Religion is corrupt and evil, while God is logical and true, as the new book From Here to Everlasting explains. According to religion, after one trillion years in torture, that is just the beginning of pain. Moreover, From Here to Everlasting expresses to you what really happened to the dinosaurs. This new book, authored by James Blessing, explains that the only good government is God and you. Please tell us the difference between what Hitler did to the Jewish people and what the United States government did to the Native Americans. From Here to Everlasting also identifies how Vietnam was an illegal war with the United States government dropping more bombs on Vietnam than it dropped on Germany and Japan in all of World War II yet losing the war in Vietnam. The only good government is God and you. From here to everlasting gives you this true hope in this new book available on Amazon. 80% of legitimate medical malpractice is not proceeding because the cost of the lawyers exceeds the value of the injury. Many are being robbed by the lying lawyers. Lawyers are taking away your free speech and your right to freely litigate by their lies and by their extreme overcomplexity. From here to everlasting exposes the lawyers and gives us the solution from God. Judges are merely politically connected lawyers. We need honest leaders, not lawyer judges. Lawyers want turmoil, divorce, war, and crime. We want the opposite. From here to everlasting gives you true hope. This is a true book from God to you. Overpopulation is killing planet Earth and you and your loved ones. Yet the government rewards bad behavior by paying people to have nine kids with nine different fathers. This new book, From Here to Everlasting, gives us hope. Without hope, there is nothing. My name is James Blessing, and your book of true hope is From Here to Everlasting at Amazon. All right, James, thank you so much, and thanks to all of our authors who joined us for this edition of the Page Publishing Book Club. If you missed anything, just go to 710WOR.com and download the podcast. I'm Alice Dacton Rossini. I'll see you next time.